Hello and welcome back to the DCS Sit Rip, where we discuss and analyze news and information about the world's premier combat flight simulator for the home PC, DCS World. I'm your host, Prickly Hedgehog, and I'd like to say thanks for all the support recently and discussion from last week's Sit Rip and video where we talked about ED and how it laid down its overarching road path for 2024, which I must say looks pretty promising. Now, amidst the myriad of projects and injections of new content into DCS World, we do have a plethora of third-party products sitting in the wings also. And to that end, ED plugged an exciting Cold War stalwart coming to DCS World soon, and that is from Grinelli Designs, and it is the F100D, the Hun. So let's begin talking about this little gem and some of the major updates on progress from Grinelli Designs. The project was greeted with a good deal of excitement when it was originally announced into DCS World by Grinelli, and today's newsletter revealed what the team has been working on and the progress that they've made in its recent development. Now, here's a blurb from Grinelli themselves. They say, our dedicated team completed an extensive journey across Texas, Georgia, Ohio, and Indiana, meticulously scanning. F-100 aircraft to guarantee the utmost quality and precision. With the infusion of these invaluable resources, our team is channeling creativity and expertise to bring the Super Sabre to life, ensuring every detail captures and preserves the essence of this iconic aircraft, and indeed it is something of an iconic aircraft. Now back to what ED is saying, uh, here an exceptional experience took place in Fort Wayne, Indiana, where an immersive week unfolded due to a fuel valve failure with the last flying F-100. So yes, there is one out there that's still flying. And this unforeseen event offered Grinelli a unique opportunity to engage in detailed aircraft maintenance, capturing essential sounds and aerial footage. The experiences, they say, complemented by insights from veterans, will play a crucial role in shaping this highly realistic module. The project is progressing steadily, focusing on the development of a comprehensive and accurate flight model for the Super Sabre through a combination of computational methods, real aerodynamic data, and wind tunnel tests. The team is meticulously refining the model to accurately replicate the intricate dynamics of the actual aircraft. This effort stands as a testament to the team's commitment to delivering a high-quality authentic experience in the world of DCS. Now, in terms of the overall progress, uh, there is still a lot to do. And if we look at Grinelli's indicated uh, progress level, it sits at about 53% as an overall progress measure. Now, I imagine that with the increased access to this recent information, along with the other data that they have, this is only going to help them with the overall quality and hopefully too with their overall progress pace although i imagine with extra detail it may encourage them to do other things or has added extra work nonetheless i think it's an exciting project and i wish them all the best as i said before when the project was first revealed as coming to dcs from the team it was very 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 well received now what can we expect from this kind of aircraft in the game remember it really is an early cold war aircraft of the 1950s era so we'll have plenty of analog dials and switches to deal with and an analog flight control system now it flew for many years including in both the korean conflicts and vietnam however by then it was rapidly being superseded by more advanced aircraft like for example the a7e2 and the general advances in aviation technology. As for the A7, of course, that's being done by third-party developers flying iron simulations, and we had a big update about the progress that they're working on similarly towards the end of last year. Getting back to the Hun, now it was a supersonic aircraft, so it is fast, but like a lot of the early experiments with high-speed flight, there were problems with that original design, and unfortunately a spate of accidents which killed test pilots and eventually grounded the aircraft for a while until these things were ironed out. So the aircraft had a propensity to suffer from inertia coupling. 
which was a design problem and feature of early jet aircraft. And this was because the fuselages themselves tended to be elongated to reduce drag, and that created some gyroscopic effects in areas other than the roll axis, and under certain flight conditions, this can cause the aircraft to depart rapidly as inertia overwhelms the flight control systems and disintegrates the entire airframe. So basically you get a catastrophic failure of the, of the airframe and typically would lead to the death of the pilot. So the cure in part for the F-100 was a larger vertical tail. This helped to enhance directional stability as well as yaw and pitch dampers later on as it uh, progressed in its development, again to, depend, uh, to prevent it from departing. It really was at the cutting edge of this era of supersonic flight and men literally did risk their lives in the perfection of supersonic flight with this aircraft and of course others as well which is something we take for granted today most pilots will tell you really crossing the sound barrier in a modern fighter jet is pretty benign almost anticlimactic uh, for most pilots when they say they finally get there and there isn't all the drama that they perhaps were expecting so it's a lot safer and it's thanks to the early work that was done by these pilots and the designers of these early aircraft uh, to help us get there. Now the F-100 unfortunately doesn't have the best track record as a fighter either. It was favored as a nuclear bomb tosser due to its high speed along with uh, many other aircraft of the era but according to some sources the US Air Force lost up to 50 aircraft a year in Vietnam and combat losses alone. So it did perform an enormous number of sorties, well over 300,000 sorties, which is uh, more than some units did in World War II. Uh, so when you're doing combat sorties, you are, like any aircraft, performing over highly defended targets. It's going to be vulnerable to anti-aircraft fire. It was not credited with any official air-to-air -air kills, just a probable kill early in the war. In fact, it engaged in one of the first uh, aerial combats of the war. Uh, but I don't think that's going to matter to the legion of fans that this aircraft has and, of course, legend of early supersonic flight and development in the early Cold War period. So again, let me know if you think we're onto something here with this aircraft and what you think about Grinelli's progress on the F-100D in the comments section below. I think it's going to be a great addition as a very early Cold War era aircraft. It's going to join several others. We talked about the MiG-17 last week. We have the MiG-19, the MiG-15, uh, the F-86, um, and various other aircraft that are uh, part of what is a growing and popular segment in the DCS world environment. Campbell 01, I verify your angel 40,000. Well, turning now to something else, and I mentioned before that ED had laid out some of its own roadmap for 2024, and they highlighted on one of the many changes to be implemented in this rapidly evolving game right now, because there's tons of stuff that they've talked about. The big one is going to be core engine changes with regards to Vulcan API. Now, in the screenshot that you should be looking here, you can see the results of improved procedural grass distribution across terrain tiles, ED say. So compared to other types of vegetation, such as shrubs or trees, grass has a more regular standard geometric structure. However, the benefit is outweighed by the huge quantity of distinct and subtle flora that may be found on fairly small pieces of terrain even. So in order to provide interactivity and stable frame rates on any but the smallest maps, the brute force method of covering the entire landscape with individual grass blade models was really impractical, they say. So they continue to work on a more efficient approach to grass distribution, and they have enhanced grass shading by using ambient occlusion. They also improved vegetation shading with the release of screen space shadows, or triple S. And furthermore, they're now working on new vegetation visual effects from explosions, gunfire, and aircraft. No mention there of napalm for all you Vietnam map fans uh, and fans of Vietnam era aircraft. But nonetheless, this is an exciting development. So we'll have to stay tuned for more information from ED, more images, presumably, of this particular development. In the opening blurb, they said they made reference to the most recent DCS open beta update, where you may have noticed some improvements to procedural grass diversity and shading across terrains, such as the channel and also DCS Syria. I haven't checked this out myself, but we'll take their word for it. Uh, the game's looking really good right now, I have to say, and every improvement seems to just 
add just that little bit more immersion. So they are continuing to enhance the grass distribution across the terrain files, as we kind of hinted at here, and grass blades now bend to achieve a more natural look. And that is definitely true with the helicopter uh, downdraft effects. It looks really cool. So this new technology, they say, is going to be available um, in our terrain development kit, they describe, offering official third-party maps the opportunity to enhance low-level realism for their terrain maps too so i'm curious to see what that will do uh, to enhance the various maps in the game in terms of a more natural um, vegetation feel this is especially challenging work i think but it does embellish that low level flying experience especially important in helicopters where you want to see and enjoy your vegetation movements as we talked about with the downdraft um, in the trees as you're taking off as you hover over things or are moving transitioning around areas where there is vegetation so anything that we get that improves this is going to be good for us and definitely what i've seen so far is very impressive and it's a major improvement on what we traditionally had where where things didn't really move at all it was sort of static so i'm curious to see how that gets ev you know evolved i'm curious to see if you can have debris being kicked up so some sort of fault and if that's going to um if there's going to be dust that can bounce off solid objects and kind of rather than just sort of blend into it, if that makes sense, see if it actually causes uh, stuff to, to rattle off things. And, you know, that's a lot of complex physics. I get that. But I'm just curious to, you know, to see how far they're going to take it. Let me know if you agree. Let me know what you want to see in that. Or let me know if you think they're on the right track. I think it's a great improvement. And I'm looking forward to, as I said, more improvements in that area. Magic, Anchor 6 one for the whole 2 four, zero. So that really wraps up the major news from the ED team uh, and the newsletter itself. They rounded out that they have a plug for the Grey Flag Death from Above, a hardcore persistent multiplayer PVE or player versus environment multiplayer server, if you're unfamiliar with the uh, term there. Uh, they encouraged you to team up and liberate territories on one of their four servers and conduct strikes on enemy SAMs, factories, bases, runways, and more. So lots of variety there. Uh, be careful, though. They say some members can occasionally fight as a red four. So you're going to have to keep your eyes and ears out. That'll keep you on your toes. The server harbors enemy forces who will attempt to resupply and reinforce their positions and even launch counteroffenses as you and your team attempt to push the front line and liberate areas. Your task is to set up ground units, deliberate and capture objectives, or defend with ground forces. So note the positions of units will be saved when the server restarts, and you will log straight back into this persistent battlefield, they call it. Uh, the f uh, server also features the combined arms module, which presumably you'll need to be able to participate. So again, a nice plug. Um, there's lots of servers out there offering this kind of service, this kind of detail on a wide range of uh, other gaming experience as well in DCS World. If you have one of those or you know one that's worthy of recommendation or mention, uh, do so in the comment section below for others to see and let me know about it. I'm always curious to see what the creative community members are doing. And uh, some of these servers are closed, some of them member only, etc., etc. So there's a you know, huge player base out there that's taking advantage of multiplayer. Again, let us know if you have a good one in the comment section below. Campbell Zero on Magic Squad Mode C. Now, speaking of seeing, I have been, as you know, uh, tentatively testing the Pimax Crystal VR headset, which features the highest resolution of any of the sort of public products currently available in the VR department. Pimax have been very, very kind uh, to send me out a headset to produce a review on. That review is not quite ready yet. I'm going to spend some more time on that. Uh, time was limited for me this week with work commitments soaking up all my free time. So based on early experiences, though, that I've had with the headset, I'm extremely impressed with what I'm seeing thus far. And you may have seen Wags comment on uh, one of my um, community tabs where he also expressed some positivity for this um, unit. He said he was very impressed as well with it. Like all VR systems, though, there's definitely some dialing in to do and set up before you can kind of run DCS. And it takes a bit to get comfortable with the sensation and, and getting it set up on your head and all the rest of it. So uh, these things are not really just plug and play. There's always a little bit of tinkering that needs to occur. That's to be expected. I was, though, absolutely blown away by my first experience last weekend. Once I got it up and running, I even actually got so excited, I jumped up and I invited Mrs. Prickly Hedgehog to experience the interior of the cockpit of an F-15E. She actually sat there 
longer than I had experienced it for several minutes exploring the cockpit and looking at the um, the guy behind the uh, the wizard and she was uh, thought it was pretty cool and I was getting a little bit worried she wasn't going to hand the the thing back to me and then she immediately acknowledged once she'd given it back to me this is all you're going to want to do now because it does look pretty cool so she was a little bit envious to be honest um because she likes to uh no she likes to hang out with me from time to time apparently I'm I'm fun to hang out with um but anyway uh yes very very impressed with this but like I said I'd like to spend more time with it uh as a recent Nvidia software upgrade seemed to mess with the settings a little bit and has, has detracted from my experiences that I've had with it earlier. I just did a, there was a software upgrade recently or download recently, and I did that yesterday. And then when I put the headset back on, I just wasn't getting the same effect that what I'd had earlier. So I'm going to have to troubleshoot that. Frame rates were taking a bit of a hit, and I'm not sure if I balked something between letting it sit idle for several days since the last weekend um, and um, MLK Day. So um, stay tuned, essentially, for a, more comprehensive review in the coming weeks on the Pimax Crystal and also a new series of videos that I'm scripting right now for DCS and also periphery equipment, which I think you're going to enjoy. So stay tuned. We've got good content coming for the channel. Once again, I just want to say thanks for tuning in again. Thanks for all the support, the likes, the comments and um, the sharing. Keep that up. It helps the channel chug along. And we'll wrap up here. That's it for this week. We'll see you next time on the DCS Sit Rip. This is Prickly Hedgehog out. See ya. Uh, 300, 300, 300. Power 61, approved this request.